Oh, good evening, everyone. My name is Randall Pinkston. It is my honor to welcome you to the 14th Annual Ippies Awards, the only awards program that recognizes excellence in New York's independent ethnic and community media sector. This is, as some of you know, this is my third year since I've been uh, MC at the Ippies. It's always a thank you very much. <laughs> and I'll pay you after the program for that. Um, this is <laughs> It's always a treat to be here, in all seriousness, uh, to sample the foods, to hear the many languages spoken, to meet and mingle with journalists, and just to make new friends and to say hello to old friends. This is, of course, an international city. As some of you may know, I used to work for CBS News. I've traveled the world, met a lot of people, but I don't have to tell you that you do not have to leave New York to meet the world here at your doorstep. There's a change in tonight's program. Um, Council Member Carlos Menchaca was unable to join us, but we do have a couple of special guests here tonight, and they have agreed to share a few words with us. And so, without further delay, let me call to the podium our Dean of the City University of New York's Graduate School of Journalism, Sarah Bartlett. She will introduce our special guest. <laughs> Oops, will this work? Yes. Thank you guys for coming. We are so happy to have you here. This is truly one of the favorite evenings of this school. Um, there's so many people in the audience who we want to thank. Um, I, I can't resist singling out Juana Ponce de Leon, although she'll kill me, because um, the Ippies really started on, under her watch, for those of you who've been around a long time. Stand up, Juana. Go on, take a bow. And we have a number of uh, very helpful advisors to the Center for Community and Ethnic Media. Um, a number of them are here tonight from our, our advisory council. So if I could ask them to stand up, please, as well. And thank you for your work. <laughs> Tina Lee, Mark. <laughs> we have a number of sponsors who we're grateful for, but you'll probably hear about that from lots of other people later. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving forward. Um, and really just to say to Karen and to Jahangir, who do a really extraordinary work with the staff that works with them, Jennifer Chang uh, among them, uh, this center means so much to the school. It's our chance to uh, make sure that we stay very connected to the rich and vibrant, uh, diverse ethnic and community media in the city. So it's you enrich us, and this is our one night a, a year when we get to try to give back to you. Um, let me move straight away to our guest speaker, who um, we're, we're so happy that he came tonight. And um, I think he really doesn't need that much introduction because he is our controller. And for those of us who live in Manhattan, he's been our borough president for many years and was representing us up in Albany. That's a whole nother story. Um, and he's just done you know, a lot to focus on things that matter to people like us, which are public accountability, um, wage theft, you know, immigration issues. There's just so many areas in which Scott has been helpful to us. So please join us, Scott Stringer, the controller. Thank you very much. And I'm actually really happy uh, that Carlos couldn't make it, okay? <laughs> and he's a great councilman, and he's probably work, he's working very hard tonight, but good for me, uh, because I actually think that so many of you in this room, your publications, the work that you do is really the future of New York City. When you think about New York right now, it's like, uh, it's unlike any other place in the world. We speak 170 different languages from 200 countries. And we need the community newspaper, the ethnic media, to tell the story about what's going on in New York. I know they're the big guns in media, and they have a role to play. But make no mistake, what you're doing on the ground in every community is what matters. First, if you're an activist, if you're on the community board, the precinct council, if you're head of your parent association, you wait for the local newspaper to come out. If it's in a box, you go to the box. If it's in the supermarket, you get in the supermarket because that's the news you care about. You want to know that your community, you want to know what your community is about and what your community is doing. 
And that can't be told in the big papers. It has to be on the ground from the bottom up. When I, when I was growing up, I lived in a neighborhood north of Harlem called Washington Heights. And back then, there were no developers, there were no banks, there were no much of anything except hardworking people who settled into a community of different backgrounds and got along and figure out, figured out how to educate kids. But the one common thread that the community had were activists who always knew that they had to go it alone. But there was a local newspaper, the Heights Inwood, that told the story of the community. And that's what got me involved in local politics because my family was very political in that neighborhood. But I remember as a kid, every Wednesday that paper came out. Tom Robbins believes this is true because he's known me a long time. And I waited for the Heights Inwood to go into the candy store where I could get the Heights Inwood, right, for 10 cents and I could score, you know, something to eat. You know, didn't bring change home. But that told the story of our community. And today, it's up to the city to invest in community newspapers. You see, when a big publication like the Post, Daily News, the New York Times, you know, they have to make money or commit to not lose that much money in telling their story, right? And so they sell ads and they obviously have a lot of resources. And I think that's all to the good. We want every paper to do well. But there's something not right when city dollars go to a certain group of newspapers and crumbs are given to the rest of the neighborhood. Because the city dollars support our larger newspapers, but we also have to start creating a, a mechanism for the people who are publishing to have that economic success. It is about women and minority-owned businesses, right? <laughs> and so to talk a little business with you as controller, we did do an analysis. And it shows very clearly, we have got to start creating a level playing field so everybody can get those dollars. But more importantly, why does the city spend money advertising at all? We do it because we want to make sure that when there are job opportunities, people know about it. When there's wage theft and we're looking for workers, we want to advertise and talk about it. When we think about the different services the city offers from health care to daycare to pre-K, we want to make sure New Yorkers know about it. But here's the thing. If you don't have a wide net, you're only going to get a certain group of people to know what's going on. And now more than ever, given the great diversity of this city, people from all over the world coming here, we do have to do a better job engaging you. And I just want you to know that there's a lot of elected officials who want to see that happen but we need your help to continue to make the case. And finally, I really wanted to come by because I never got invited to the Academy Awards or the Tony Awards, and I wouldn't have gone even if I was invited. But there's something about the Ippy Awards, right, that I think are special. And I know CUNY takes this very seriously. I know that the faculty takes this very seriously. And I want you to know that many people recognize the accomplishments. And to all the awardees here tonight, we take this seriously. This is a big deal. It matters. It speaks to the future of the city. And lastly, I, I just want to say, not knowing every place that Tom Robbins has uh, worked in his career making politicians so miserable, right? <laughs> no, I could tell you miserable. In fact, when Tom Robbins calls an elected official like me, the first thing you say is, oh, no, right? First thing you say is, I'm not here. But he gets you eventually. But I want you to know that his kind of journalism and the journalism that you practice being a community navigator is what holds the politicians accountable, holds big government accountable, and as I think Tom could say even more eloquently, giving, given his generation of journalism, you got to keep the rascals at bay. And part of th what you do is ask probing questions, demand answers, and make elected officials and government leaders better people. If you were not here, then this system could not possibly run. And the fourth estate matters. I just happen to think that that should be practiced in many different languages 
and many different cultures, and that's what tonight is all about. So congratulations to all the awardees. It really is an honor to be here. If you want me to come back next year, I'll just come. You just gotta, you know, you just, you, I'll come no matter who's here. Thank you all very much, it's great to be here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Controller, before you go, just a personal point. Uh, you also take care of the pension funds, right? <laughs> I have some former city workers who are relatives of mine. We appreciate that. Thank you so very much. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you, Controller Stringer, for joining us now. Before we proceed to giving out the awards, uh, we would like to invite another one of our special guests, the Chief of Staff of Mayor de Blasio's Office of Immigrant Affairs, Sung E. Bay, to come up to the podium and share some thoughts with us. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me on behalf of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, also known as Moya, for saying, uh, um, to come say a few words. I'm honored to be here with all of you as publishers, editors, and reporters you are all um, playing this critical role in terms of bringing awareness to some of the most pressing issues facing immigrant communities. First and foremost, I extend a deep appreciation to the CUNY School of Journalism and the Center for Community and Ethnic Media for their longstanding commitment to supporting ethnic and community media. So. And with that, um, we also want to honor and thank the co-directors, uh, Jahangir and Karen. Um, you have been ensuring that the IPI's legacy of honoring journalistic excellence endures among ethnic and community press. The center's members and publication, Voices of New York, shines a light on New York City's diverse communities and delivers critical information that is often unavailable elsewhere. I also want to thank Randall um, Pinkston for being a wonderful MC and um, also a great journalist. I want to recognize that several members of City Hall's press office are here, including Rosemary Baglin and Jessica Ramos. As director of um, Latino media, Jessica acts as the liaison between City Hall and community and ethnic media an effort the de Blasio administration has undertaken to ensure that all New Yorkers are well informed on what the city and its various agencies are doing to improve their lives. I think everyone here agrees on the critical importance of the work you all do, and Moya and Mayor de Blasio are equally deeply committed to community and ethnic media. Earlier this year, and in fact here at CUNY, we announced the creation of a senior level staff person who would build language access capacity. A large part of this is having the different city agencies work with ethnic media outlets to get the word out about their services. Moya, with the strong support of the mayor, has already trained the communications departments at city agencies on accessing ethnic media and the importance of making ethnic and community media ad buys to reach all New Yorkers. To ensure that engagement of community and ethnic media becomes standard citywide practice, Moya has worked with the Mayor's Office of Operations, the City Hall Press Office, the City Council Speaker Office, and the CUNY School of Journalism to create an online directory of ethnic and community media. And it's working. Recently at a conference held at the Center for Community and Ethnic Media, some of you were there and heard directly from the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Moya about our plans to invest even more extensively in community and ethnic media through advertising. Not only are our communications efforts multilingual, the way our city services are delivered are multilingual too. And in fact, today, any New Yorker can call 311 and say language access and be able to submit a complaint if they do not receive interpretation when seeking city services. This builds on the successes of the de Blasio administration, which is responsible for the first major ad campaigns addressed to New York's immigrant communities. These campaigns include DACA Healthcare Access, IDNYC, the Department of Consumer Affairs Paid Sick Leave and Earned Income Tax Credit Campaigns, 
and pre-K for all. Campaigns like IDNYC were successful because they were based in the languages and publications that all New Yorkers use. And many of those publications are represented in this room. So from, uh, on behalf of Moya, I just want to thank you again for all that you do and for your support. So congratulations to all of those who are being honored here tonight. And Moya really looks forward to continuing to work with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bay. Now I would like to introduce the uh, renowned, internationally famous co-directors of the Center for Community and Ethnic Media, Karen Pinner and Jehangir Kotak. so much to uh, our speakers tonight. Um, welcome to the 14th Annual Ippies Awards. Um, this is the fifth year that the Ippies, so named because they are awarded to members of the independent press, not the mainstream media, have been sponsored by the Center for Community and Ethnic Media at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Today, more than 300 media outlets are playing a pivotal role in the city's and the region's discourse. They're looking at how gentrification and affordable housing affect neighborhoods in Brooklyn, how immigrant entrepreneurs are staking out new businesses in the Bronx, how voter registration and civic engagement are growing in various ethnic enclaves in Queens. They're looking at the problems and challenges confronting their communities and highlighting successes and accomplishments. We're here tonight to celebrate the journalists who do that work. Now we'd like to tell you a little bit about our work. Jahangir. Greetings and a warm welcome to everyone. I'm happy to be here and happy to share news of the center with all of you. At CCM, we work hard to represent and to help the community and ethnic media in this city. And this year, we have been getting the sense that some of our efforts may be paying off. The city is giving new and greater attention to this media sector, promising to place more advertising in the ethnic media and to offer greater access to reporters. In January, the center was invited to testify at hearings of the Committee on Immigration of the New York City Council. Today the, city is promising, uh, today, the city is promoting its new directory uh, of media outlets based in part on work done previously by CCM in surveying this sector for its own directory, Many Voices, One City. And at numerous events held over the past year at the CUNY J School, city officials have connected in new ways with community and ethnic media. That happened most recently at the center's advertising conference where Bita Mustafi, assistant commissioner at Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and representatives from New York City government agencies talked about how the ethnic press can work with the city and get more ads from the city. We facilitate connections with the city leaders through our newsmakers briefings hosted by New York One's Errol Lewis, who also runs the urban reporting program at the J School. At each of these events, two journalists from the ethnic press join Errol as panelists to question our guests. Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson has been among the noteworthy guests, as have Comptroller Scott Stringer, Health Commissioner Mary Bethett, and Taxi and Limousine Commissioner Mira Joshi. We also hold special sessions such as the very popular one at which the USCIS and legal authorities warned of immigrant services scams. One of the center's goals is to run training sessions to help community and ethnic reporters and editors gain new skills. And just last fall, we introduced a new multi-session training program in covering business 
and financial, financial news. Finally, at our flagship site, Voices of New York, we continue to feature the excellent work of the community and ethnic press, supplemented by stories original to the site written by students and freelancers. We track events affecting various communities, reporting recently on reaction to the financial distress in Puerto Rico and on reaction in the Brazilian community here to the political upheavals in Brazil. We reported on what the Korean community had to say in the Korean press about the New York Times stories on abuses in the nail salon industry. And we provided reaction from the Chinese owners of nail salons. We reported on a specialty food pay purveyor in Newark's Ironbound and a Disney World of Food in Manhattan's Curry Hill. And of course, we run dozens of stories affecting immigrants from updating the news on DACA and DAPA to wage theft and other labor abuses. And this year, we broke new ground with a series of articles on translating New York, including a first person account on providing Thai translation as a non-professional medical interpreter. Before continuing with the program, we would like to thank a few people. Jennifer Chang, our associate editor, does an extraordinary job helping to edit Voices of NY and plan the EPs. Gogi Padilla did a super job with all the arrangements for the celebration. We also had help this year from our recent CUNY J School grad uh, Kenny Kanaya Krit Von Katia Korn and our Korean intern, Yor M. Choi. We also have special help with every event here at the J School, but especially at large events like this. If not for Alistair Wallace, the J School's manager for equipment and AV services, you wouldn't be able to hear us or see the images on the screens. Pam Drayton, our director of public safety and facilities, supervises logistics. Public safety officers Ramel Butcher, Frandy Germain, and Pauline Floyd look out for us and our guests. And George Chermak and Steve Haynes do yeoman service, setting up and dismantling the space at these events. If I've forgotten anyone, I'm sincerely sorry. Many thanks to everyone who's helped us out. And we want to offer a special note of thanks as well to Eat Off Beat, which provided most of the cuisine for this event. Eat Off Beat promotes ethnic cuisine from many countries, drawing on the skills of expert chefs who are refugees, many of them from conflict overseas. Thanks so much to Eat Off Beat. Now, back to you, Randall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jin Kong Gare. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for has finally arrived. It's time to award the Ippies for the best work produced in 2015 by community and ethnic press in the New York City area. We are awarding prizes in nine categories this year, and we are omitting this year the multimedia category because there were too few entries. Helping me to announce the winners will be Professor Tom Robbins, who teaches investigative reporting here at the CUNY Journalism School. He was the lead judge for the IPPES investigative category and recently himself won a coveted award, the Sidney Hillman Award, and we're bearing the lead. He was a Pulitzer Prize finalist this year. Congratulations, sir. Each IPPES category was reviewed by two or three judges drawn from the CUNY Journalism School faculty and professional journalists. The judging panels worked independently of each other, and the winners are known only to a handful of people in this room. Now, judges, if you will please stand and accept thanks for your hard work in selecting the finalists. Judges, please stand. In the rear, thank you very much. Thank you for your work. OK, a few brief instructions for the winners. When you hear your names, Please come to the podium to receive your awards, and in order to keep the program moving quickly, we ask that you refrain from taking photographs during the presentation. Okay, you got that? Let me just repeat that, because <laughs> it has been my experience, this is my third year, that that instruction kind of like flies over everybody's head. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not multilingual, so I will say it slowly. Please refrain from taking photographs during the presentation. 
Okay. After the awards, uh, there will be official photographs taken in the research center, which is to your right, to my left. Uh, these photos will be shared online tomorrow. And of course, you're all welcome to take photos after the event in the research center or wherever else around here Dean Bartley allow Bartlett allows you to uh, travel. Okay, Professor, <laughs> Professor Robbins, if you will come and get us started with the uh, first okay, awards. Thank all right, you, yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks for the intro. Watch yourself. All right, there. got it. Yep. You got that? Someone's taking a picture. Wait a minute. That's not someone right there. You know, you need to start. So, quickly, you know, that's stuff that Scott Stringer said about giving politicians a hard time and, and how much he likes it. All right, well, we don't really believe him, all right? I mean, I like Scott Stringer. Don't get me wrong. I think he's a wonderful guy. But it is, it is a thing that politicians say because they love it when we're doing it to the other guy. You know, and most of the questions right now are going to the other guy, you know, so everything's really good. My friend Juan Gonzalez just retired from the Daily News, 30, 29 years. <laughs> he deserves that rent. I think one of the great New Yorkers and, and one of the great reporters of New York, at his going away party that the Daily News generously threw him, he was feted by a, a clutch of congressmen uh, a United States Senator, Chuck Schumer, uh, the mayor of the city of New York, Bill de Blasio, and the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo. Not at the same time. They could not be in, this, in the room at the same time. But each of them came and said exactly what Scott Stringer said tonight about Juan, who really has taken all of them to the ringer over the years about how much they appreciated his coverage of the other guy. You know? <laughs> but... It is, it is what makes it worth doing just to hear them say it, even if they don't believe it. Right? <laughs> I'm going to start with the, our, our, best, our category of best investigative in-depth story. Uh, and instead of reading the names first, Randall, I'm going to make it so that they won't want to put the cameras out first. But let me read the description of the story, and then I'll read the name of the winner afterwards. Last summer, a man named Shangui Chen, who was 48 years old, died of cancer in New York. And there was very little reason to mark his passing. He was a fairly anonymous man, an immigrant from Fujian province, and he worked in the construction trade, the same as thousands of people like him, hardworking Chinese immigrants who came to this country in search of a better living. But reporter Mike Hong of the World Journal recognized that the personal tragedy experienced by the family there's a husband and a father, a guy who died much too young, was a story that exemplified much more than one man's story. That was the travails of many immigrants who were forced to leave their loved ones behind. Hong's moving and in-depth description of Chen's life in the United States and his failed effort to bring his wife and his daughter to America was both moving and instructive. Mike Hong of the World Journal, years of struggle in a foreign land comes to a tragic end, the third prize in our investigative reporting category. <laughs> Tried to sneak in a picture there. We caught him. <laughs> For the second year in a row, the forward continued some stellar reporting on the startling collapse of one of New York's largest and most venerated social service organizations. The Federation Employment and Guidance Service, FEGS, had been around for years. It was part of the landscape in New York social services. But the collapse led to federal and state investigations. But the forward found that even as the nonprofit was tumbling into bankruptcy and as services to its vulnerable, poor, and disabled clients were declining, Top officials were still awarding themselves lucrative bonuses. For his work on this story, Josh Nathan Cases of FEGS execs got fat payouts of bankruptcy loom. So one of the most common stories in all of our newspapers, local, citywide papers, is a story of apartment buildings where residents don't get services. Places where owners dial down the heat to be able to save on money, don't provide services in terms of pest control or in terms of safety and 
doors that don't lock, windows that leak. It's, it's one of the most common stories. We used to do with the Village Voice every year, the worst landlords of New York, an idea that's now been adopted and incorporated by the public advocate of New York who does her own list of the worst landlords. But David Cruz of the Norwood News took things a step further. He analyzed ownership records, found that things were so bad in a group of buildings that more than 1,200 complaints had been filed to the city housing department. And he found that the owner wasn't a small, struggling landlord, wasn't even an in-between guy who was, you know, owned a couple of buildings. It was one of New York's largest and wealthiest real estate firms, the Related Companies a company that some folks might remember was the favored company for the last mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who managed to steer most of the major projects in New York to them over a 12-year period. And ironically, Related had purchased the properties with millions of dollars from New York City's pension funds. Scott, are you still here? No, oh, he's gone. All right. <laughs> Norwood News' stories helped spur Stringer's office, the office of the city controller, which oversees those pension funds, to investigate and he pushed related to improve conditions. Congratulations to David Cruz of Norwood News. First prize, tenants turn heat up on landlords. Congratulations, David. Good job. The second corner category is the best story about a community. In the past, we called this the best story about an immigrant community. Now we've broadened it and we call it just best story about a community. And we had one story, which was just a story of a man who got fired, but it was a rich tale that was filled with the details of his life. And it was woven together so beautifully it painted a a picture of a man who's heading into a new phase. It was a mental image of a man moving forward. Lotus Chow, Singdao Daily, wins third place, head of largest Chinese services organizations, fired. <laughs> also, there was a story that followed the community backlash to the opening of a homeless shelter in a former hotel, one that had been pushed through by the city without any community notification. It was a story of a controversy that was well told, balanced, nuanced, and complete. Of course it was. It was written by a graduate of this school, Katie Honan, of DNA Info New York. Katie? <laughs> So this one was a real New York story. It wasn't about gentrification. It was about the evolving face of immigration in New York. It was a story that gets at the heart of a changing neighborhood, one that was illustrated with great photos and illuminated in the quotes from the two main characters. One of them was Chinese and the other was Norwegian. Singdao Daily, Jane Zhang, 50 years later, a Norwegian finds a different sunset park. Jane? So oh, in this one, the judges deem this a very detailed, comprehensive look at a subset of several communities with AME churches, American, African Methodist, Episcopalian churches, and their connection to the shooting at the AME church in South Carolina last year. This article had terrific interviews, photos, background, and context, and offering a full-fledged, well-researched report on the AME trend of preaching social justice. Rashed Mian of the Long Island Press, born out of racism, defiant AME church, first place. <laughs> nice job, congratulations. Next category is the best social issues story. 
DNA Info has been writing a lot about Mayor de Blasio lately. And in this one, they wrote about the mayor's pre-K push, detailing an exodus of experienced educators from hundreds of early childhood centers that serve the city's neediest working families. This story exposed a talent drain that leaves thousands of city children in the care of underpaid and undertrained workers. Amy Zimmer from DNA Info. This story explored the plight of teenagers placed in solitary confinement in adult prisons. Brief break. So today, if you get a chance, take a look at the most recent New Yorker posting about Khalif Browder, that terrible story that we've heard different pieces of over the last year, the fellow who spent three years locked up in Rikers for stealing a backpack, almost two of those years in solitary. For his civil suit, Khalif Browder gave several depositions, and those depositions were just obtained by Jennifer Gonerman, the reporter who covered Khalif Browder's story and his description of how he basically learned how to commit suicide while at Rikers is one of the most wrenching things I've ever read, compounded by the fact that just today, in Albany, which is finishing up its session, the assembly passed a bill called the Speedy Trials Bill, which basically would try to make so that guys like Khalif wouldn't spend three years locked up for stealing a knapsack waiting for a trial, that they would be compelled by this law to move quickly through the courts and get out sooner rather than later. That bill right now stands in front of the state senate, which is doing absolutely nothing about it at the moment. The editorial's over. <laughs> this story was about the same teenagers placed in solitary confinement, ostensibly for their own protection. But the reporters at Women's E! News, using a combination of interviews and data, show that the practice may do more harm than good. Crystal Lewis and Jolly Rao Harrell, congratulations. I saw someone sneak a picture, another one. Right. In this story, we are given a cautionary tale of East New York's Linden Plaza, a middle-income Mitchell Lama development where many tenants were forced to leave after a 93% rent hike. This story exposed a major hole in the housing safety net, how even when the city manages to preserve a Mitchell Lama complex, it often lacks the power to keep rents affordable and low. Abigail Savage Lou from City Limits, first place. In the category of best small circulation publication, we started this category last year. The competition was stiff. And again this year, the judges went through many excellent entries, reflecting the work of media outlets that don't have the resources or the reach of their larger competitors. Represent Magazine prides itself in providing a voice for youth in foster care. But it's far more than just a collection of sad stories about the miseries of life as a foster kid. It's a magazine that spotlights policy stories examining how the system works. The articles submitted for review included a piece on a new advocacy organization for foster youth, another on efforts to improve their access to higher education, and an editorial outlining practical recommendations on how to make the foster care system more manageable. Together, they show how a publication with a strong advocacy voice can also provide strong service journalism. This award goes to Represent Magazine, third place for social best small circulation. So, Manhattan's Lower East Side has always been a place that generated news. 
But last year, The Lowdown launched an ambitious eight-part series to analyze the pressures on small businesses in the community and the solutions for their survival. Their enterprising work was contained in three issues, earning this gritty little monthly its award. As it turned out, the small business survival project was the magazine Swan Song. Well, easy come, easy go. The Lowdown entered its monthly print publication with the December 2015 issue to focus on its website, which continues the same way everybody else is going. They can't afford to do print. They're on the line. And its other new projects that they're launching as well. For second place, The Lowdown. Ed Litvak and Traven Price. From the Lower East Side to the Bronx, where we have two outlets, both of them small independents that serve their communities well and that still thrive even in an era of journalistic turbulence. The Norwood News has reviewed tenants being charged to upgrade their landlord's property, how the reassignment of police officers led to a steep drop in summer crime. Its sister publication, the Riverdale Press, reported on the rise of opioid use among Northwest Bronx high school students, as well as protests to propose zoning changes and how a curbside composting pilot was reducing food waste. Both publications give voice to local frustrations and suggested solutions on their editorial and op-ed pages. They cover sports, robust lists of community and cultural events, and closely track local politics. Picture that emerge of two communities that are so much more vibrant and complex than their borough's outdated reputation. A tie for first place, Norwood News and the Riverdale Press. Best editorial commentary. There's a piece that tackles an important, intense issue in New York City, the indictment of police officer Peter Lang, a case that tore apart part of Brooklyn and that people are still debating. But Rong Xiao Ching and the Tsingdao Daily examined the controversy from many different angles and with fairness taught all perspectives, a piece that had real impact and one that helped readers understand the different points of view. Rong, third place for editorial and commentary from the Tsingdao Daily. So, in Brooklyn, Ditmas Park Corner managed to do reporting and use data in a piece about increasing violence in the neighborhood. It was a piece that carefully quantifies rising levels of murders in the neighborhood and called for more effective policing. Leanna Zagari, second place. Mr. de Blasio, do we have a gang problem in Ditmas Park? Black Star News provided compellingly written and well-reported commentary about one of the most tragic events in the nation last year, the South Carolina Massacre. Their editorial, South Carolina Massacre and the Hate That Produced Dylan Roof by Colin Benjamin got beneath the surface of the events. And it Congratulations. That's enough for me. Randall, you feel like coming back and taking over? All right, thank you. Oops. Thank you, thank you very much. And congratulations to all of the winners so far. We have some more categories to go. 
Uh, picking up now with best, whoops, hold on a second. Best overall design of a print publication. Third place was won by the Lowdowns, Kim Sillen and Trevin Rice for its May issue. The judges stated that the publication was a nice package that flowed well. The department pages were nicely presented and there was good use of color. Congratulations. Third place winners, Kim and Trevin. In second place, the Epoch Times and Winnie Wang for the September issue, showing bold use of color on the front page while remaining easy to read. There was strong use of graphics and combination of photos and other elements. Congratulations, Winnie Wang, or someone from the Epoch Times. Uh, there you are. <laughs> and now, first place for best overall design of a print publication. This goes to the forward and Kurt Hoffman. The forward delivers a clean, cohesive, and dynamic product that is easy to read with great use of color, typography, white space, images, and graphics. The design lets the story take the center stage. Congratulations. Next category, best overall design of an online publication. Third place, a familiar name, the New York Amsterdam News for what the judges call the site's readable pages, effective photo galleries, and usability via mobile, as well as the design quality and logos of its Harlem Focus and Black Experience subsites. Congratulations to the Amsterdam News staff and to Josh. Taking second place is Long Island Press. Michael Conforti and the Long Island Press staff gave the site an innovative attitude. The judges said they complimented the site for its bold use of imagery, the clean and visually appealing design of its news and section pages, and the readability of its story pages. Congratulations to the Long Island Press and Michael Conforti. Congratulations, sir. And finally, first place goes to Sinovision, English language, and James Tan. This exuberant site, said the judges, was clearly the strongest of this year's entrants. It has a lively use of colors and visuals, a clear organization on its home page and sections to convey its culturally focused content with a nod to changing medium through its hashtag section. Congratulations, Sinovision and Mr. Chan. Our next category, best photograph. This year we have two third place winners. For a mad dash around Oval Park published in the Norwood News, which illustrates the community through public events and its kids, the judges like this well-executed feature image for its upbeat image and perfect execution. Come forward, please. Adi Talwar. Adi Talwar. Congratulations. Our second third place winner is awarded to Mariella Lombard of El Diario for Lagrimas de Libertad, Tears of Freedom. Not sure about my pronunciation there, but Tears of Freedom, that you can understand, which captures a key moment in highly emotional news story. It also addresses the broader issue of incarceration in America and its impact on communities throughout New York. Congratulations, Ms. Lombard. Our second place winner, Mike Hong of World Journal, USA Life Online, for 11 years of separation from wife and daughter. The reunion came too late. This image gives expression to the intimacy of a tragic family moment and an excellent example of community coverage. Thank you and congratulations, Mr. Hong. And first place, oh, okay, cleaning the table tonight, Adi Talwar in the photo competition for photo in city limits, tenants see huge rent spikes when landlord ends discounts. This dynamic image captures the spirit of family and community. The judge has selected it as an overall winner because of its energy and usual composition. The image illustrates the mission of community photojournalism. Congratulations, Mr. Talwar. And now we come to another popular category, best Video, third place, 
entitled History of the Forward Building, goes to Yiddish Forward. What a fun video. Who would have thought the history of a building could be so engaging with the script direction and narration by Boris Sandler, the video makes clever use of music, archival footage, stills, drawing, images, and language to truly bring the paper of building and a neighborhood to life. Congratulations to the makers of the history of the forward and to Yiddish Forward, which will soon celebrate its 120th anniversary. Second place, entitled Break the Silence, Ending the Isolation of Chinese American Families with Autism. This goes to Sinovision, Melody, Sao and Fan Bu reported on how autism affects families and communities. Not an easy task. Reporting the story across cultural barriers makes the task, congratulations, even more difficult. Sinovision did an outstanding job of shining light on the condition by informing the Asian community as well as the medical community, making earlier intervention possible. And first place winner for the video giving New York's homeless sneakers from the soul. That's S-O-L-E. The winner is Brick TV. The judges said Natasha Gaspard and Timothy Etienne, editor, produced an outstanding demonstration of video reporting that incorporates compelling images and engaging narrative Unlike most video storytelling packages, Sneakers for the Soul utilizes the best techniques and style of broadcast and internet packages. Congratulations. Well reported, shot, and edited. Brick TV. <laughs> Big hand for all of the winners. Now, as um, I mentioned earlier, we will not have a multimedia winner this year, but we have one more award, the Voices of New York Award. And for that, I would like to bring Karen Penner back to the podium to make that presentation. Thank you, Randall. Uh, I know everyone's eager to get to the dessert table and celebrate the winners and take some photographs. Um, so I'll be brief. This is the second year that we're giving out the Voices of New York Award. Um, now, in the script I wrote, it comes with a check for $500. Um, the checks actually, all the winners should know the checks were not cut today. So the checks will be in the mail. Um, at any rate, this is the second year we're giving a Voices of New York award. And the idea is to single out a member of the community and ethnic press who we believe has done some extraordinary work in the previous year. The candidate we selected this year is a tireless reporter with an instinct for great stories and an uncanny ability to draw out members of the Latino communities she covers. She has written about everything from illegal cockfighting to Mexican drug lords to the legal troubles and language barriers faced by Mixteca immigrants. She is an unrelenting investigative reporter who writes hard-hitting stories but she can also write beautifully descriptive features about, for instance, the practice of pre-Columbian rituals in Flushing Meadows Park. Born in Puebla, Mexico, she worked as a reporter and political cartoonist there, then came to New York in 2009 and worked first at Diario de Mexico, then starting in 2011 at El Diario La Prensa until earlier this year when she became a digital reporter for Univision. For her dedication, passion, and excellent reporting, the Voices of New York Award goes this year to Zyra Cortez. Zyra, please come up and receive your award. last word goes to you. Well, that's the program for this evening, for this year. Thank you all so much for your participation, for your cooperation, and most important, for your contribution to telling the stories of New York, all of New York. Congratulations to all of the winners and all of those of you who support the winners. And of course, a special thanks goes to the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, Dean Bartlett, and her extremely 
excellent staff for putting together this program. Uh, Jing Hart, Jahangir, and Karen, uh, thank you so much for all that you do to make this work every year. Um, closing thoughts, Dean Bartlett? Okay then, well, it's time for pictures and dessert. Not necessarily in that order. Take care, see you next year.